Dr. Ashley, thanks so much for joining me today. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me back. <laughs> oh, well, anytime. Yeah. Your work focuses on genetics and precision medicine. What knowledge yeah. gaps are you trying to address there? Well, I think precision medicine, first of all, is, is uh, worth thinking about exactly what we mean by that and, and really it's a new term that's really come up uh, and, and given prominence by the president of all people in the last year uh, but it's not so far away from what we used to call personalized medicine the idea of tailoring medications tailoring our treatment to an individual's makeup now that might be their genetic makeup but it might also be taking other measurements much more precisely and that's that's part of the extension of, of this new term precision medicine thinking beyond genomics to other kind of omic technologies uh, and other kind of ways of measuring people a bit more precisely. Can you give an example of another omic besides Certainly. genomic? Certainly, yeah. <laughs> well, we think of the genome as, as the, the kind of, if you like, the recipe for every cell. Every cell in the body has, has a genome and, and it then reads off that genome to decide what kind of cell it's going to be. Mm -hmm. um, but that's really only the DNA in each cell in the body. Now, what does, it, what does that genome code for? It codes for, well, there are genes that code then for proteins. And the proteins do the work of the cell. And so we can measure not exactly all the proteins yet, but we can measure a lot of proteins now. And so proteomics would be another kind mm. of omic uh, technology. And that's often the one people think of next, proteomics. In between the protein and the, the original DNA is RNA, which is a, a messenger, if you like, of, of the message. And, and sometimes we call that transcript omics because wow. it's transcription. And so that's just three. There are many others. <laughs> and uh, there are studies such as the one uh, carried out by Mike Snyder here, our chair of genetics, uh, where he looked at multi-omic technology and measured as many omics as he could find on, on himself. Have it, are, do any of these other omics have clinical application yet or, or really just genomics at this yeah, point? Yeah, that's a very good question. So um, really at the, at the moment, genomics is the tip of the spear. Okay. Uh, it's the one that is currently happening today. I mean, I think in the high throughput genomic technology uh, sequencing the exome, sequencing the genome, that, that's actually in medical care today, very rapidly uh, moving forward. Proteomics, I think, is coming, is coming next, uh, and there are some applications for transcriptomics, not very many. Uh, okay. they're, they're still in the research domain predominantly, but they're coming fast, and so I think we build the infrastructure to deal with genomics, then I think we'll be in the much better state to deal with all the other omics that are just coming down the pike. Wow, I had no idea how many omics there were, really. <laughs> <laughs> there are a new one every day. A new one every day. <laughs> yeah. How far are we from having genomics or any of the other omics being a, really a routine part of medical care? I think that uh, genomics isn't, isn't routine yet either, in the sense that we are using it every day, but we're using it for patients with uh, genetic diseases predominantly. We do look forward to a day, I hope not too far in the future, where we start to spread out that technology to apply to much more broad range of patients. For example, pharmacogenomics, the idea of using genomics to tailor medications to an individual's genomic makeup and, and do a better job, I hope, of, of personalizing their therapy. That will come soon, I think. Uh, there's a great applications of genomics in cancer, uh, those, and that's probably the next major frontier, is sequencing both the individual and their tumor and being able to work out uh, really what is the basis of the cancer. So rather than classifying it from the tissue that the cancer came from, which is traditionally what we've done, you can classify it according to the tumor biology. And that means that you can then target the tumor's biology with your therapy. Uh, and so that's really the next thing that's coming. Uh, and part of, of what the president announced in his precision medicine initiative was focused on that, the idea of, of thinking about cancer as the next frontier in precision medicine. Can we look beyond the next frontier for a minute? After cancer, what do you think could benefit from being uh, the subject of genetic study? Well, I, you know, I think that we would love to have a situation where everybody essentially had a genome in their medical record. That I would mean, be great. We've yeah. had that vision for a while. We've sort of been building for it. But I think it's really important to show what the benefit really will be. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, you know, I think there's uh, some skepticism initially when we were doing predictive testing for sort of every disease out there sure. as to where the benefit really lies. I think just because we have a test doesn't mean that we should necessarily use it. So we need to build an evidence base for that, show that it's really contributing and that it can alter our therapy. Because what's the point of a diagnostic test if it doesn't change the way you treat the patient? Right, just um, rack up costs, Right, really. exactly, exactly. And then there was a study that, I, that we published in the last year that looked specifically at that. If we introduced genome sequencing to the clinic, actually in this case, a primary care clinic, what would the costs be? Because there's been a lot of discussion about perhaps they'll just go wildly out of control. You know, it's sort of the thousand dollar genome, but the million dollar interpretation. Sure. You know, and the healthcare costs might spiral. We were yes. surprised surprised actually to find that the number of tests that the doctors would have ordered, and these weren't us, we, we gave the 
uh, interpretation to the GPs for the patients. Mm. And they said, well, based on this report, I would order these tests. And actually, it turned out it was about six hundred dollars worth of testing. Okay. At the end of the day, so more than they would have without. More the than genome. they would have done. Okay. Yeah. So not not a million dollars. Okay. <laughs> not, well, uh, true. Hopefully, not bankrupting our healthcare system, uh -huh. but certainly, uh, you know, and in one of those cases, this was only ten individuals. In, in one of them, we found a very important variant that predisposed to breast or ovarian cancer. And so I think that the money that could have been saved from very expensive chemotherapy yeah. uh, for an individual who may have ended up having breast cancer uh, has to be weighed against the cost of the testing, which is falling every day. Certainly more than $600, those Correct. savings. Yeah, so absolutely. it's really cost-effective medicine. And I think we need to do that cost-effectiveness analysis for genomic medicine. And, and we're only really just getting to that now. But I, I'm very encouraged by the fact that a number of economists, health economists, have got interested in this area, because that's the kind of evidence base we need to really uh, move the needle and, and really get this mainstream in, in healthcare. Dr. Ashley, thank you so much for speaking with me today. You're welcome. Thanks for having me.